Um, we're here today with Martin Whitaker, the Santa Barbara Club. It's, um, it's just a joy to be able to host Martin. Um, we've now been working, he and I, for eight years, as many of you know, that the, um, that the Academy, uh, together with the Chopra uh, Foundation, incubated uh, Just Capital uh, back in uh, 2012, I believe. And, and, and from that, many things emerged, including Whitaker, Mr. Martin Whitaker, who is the CEO from that time, about 2014 to the present time. Uh, Martin's got a very distinguished background on Wall Street. Uh, his PhD is in, in environmental economics, environmental science. sciences, and uh, not only is he a very smart guy because he's that, but he's also extremely committed to helping businesses make a more a larger difference than we currently have been on some of the most prominent uh, prominent issues of the day, such as pay equity, um, gender equity, uh, and a variety of other things he may or may not get into today. That has been the the work of Just Capital. Last but not least, our partner for the first seven or eight, seven years, I guess, was Forbes magazine. Uh, and that's now switched our partner to CNBC. So if Martin looks familiar, it's because you've seen him on television more than once likely. Martin, thanks so much for coming to Santa Barbara and joining us. Thanks, Ronaldo. Um, and thank you for giving up some time on a Monday morning at short notice. Um, I, uh, Ronaldo has been, um, well, first of all, a great host in Santa Barbara for me and my youngest son. I'm um, actually here on a college tour, as I mentioned to some of you, um, at, looking at UC Santa Barbara, which which where I spent the weekend. Um, but what an awful campus. I don't know how these people <laughs> managed to survive. The beach, the surfing, the, the facilities. Let me just tell you a little bit first about me, and then I'll talk about Just Capital and why I'm excited about what, what we're doing. Uh, I, uh, I'm from the UK. I studied chemistry. I did my PhD in environmental science. I worked briefly in the oil and gas industry for ELF. And my boss then was a visionary. I was in the environmental department and he, he said, Martin, if you want to make an impact on the world, follow the money. So that's what I, that's what I did. Um, I, uh, took an MBA in finance. I uh, became an analyst, one of the first um, ESG firms, which we then sold to MSCI ultimately, um, Innovest. And um, I sort of moved into the world of, of, of finance and investing um, with Swiss Re in New York, where we were very focused on climate um, because it was a huge economic issue. Um, and so we were also investing off the balance sheet into clean technology and clean energy and um, sustainable companies. And Swiss Re is the leader in those spaces in the mid 2000s. Then I moved into the private wealth area, worked for uh, Jesse and Betsy Fink. Jesse was the co founder of Priceline and um, really a pioneer in the family office world of investing to make money and to protect intergenerational wealth transfer, but also. To, to invest along his values. Uh, and those two things were not antithetical. They were not uh, somehow difficult to, to sort of achieve both. You know, he, he, he really, you know, felt like the one supported the other. And indeed that's been my experience. And then uh, I helped co-found an a, a independent um, RIA called Sonen Capital. Um, and in fact, we had some, clients and prospects in Santa Barbara, which is what brought me here last probably about nine, nine, 10 years ago. So when I was approached about the CEO role at Just Capital, it hit every point of my career at that stage, which was data and analysis, investing and business as a force for good. And then how do you create change and scale? And was there a business case that did we feel as though Investing in just companies was also a great investment thesis. That was the original idea, the index, which you took to Paul Jones, our chair. Um, and, you know, uh, a recognition really that business and society had to be mutually reinforcing. The companies that were solving societal problems were those companies that were going to compete most successfully and uh, build long-term value. Um, so the idea of using capitalism 
uh, and business as a way to tackle our most systemic challenges to me is bread in the bone. And I feel like that has defined my career and defined, I hope, uh, the future of, of, uh, of where we go. So um, there's a couple of things you need to know about Just Capital. First of all, we're, we're 501c3. Um, we are there with a mission, first and foremost, a mission to build a just economy and through that, a just society. You also need to know that we don't define what just means. Doesn't matter what I think or what Ronaldo thinks or Paul Tudor Jones thinks, this is about what the American people think. So we've done extensive survey and polling all around the country to take the pulse of the American people on what they think a just business looks like. And the results of that over the last eight years have been remarkably consistent. Put your workers first, invest in uh, invest in your employees, you know, provide fair, fair wage, fair livable wage, which is the number one issue last year. Um, you know, support a workplace that can drive better engagement, better culture, um, training, education, good benefits, all of those things. So, so the set of issues that we've identified under the worker category, when you ask people to weight those issues are always the most heavily, heavily weighted. Um, but it's not all about workers. It's also about how a company treats its customers, invests and supports the communities where it operates, including its supply chains throughout the world. The environment, of course, not just health, uh, pollution, climate, and products, safety and, and sustainability of products. Um, and it's, it's also about making money, you know, how a company is led. The American public are well aware of the fact companies have to make a profit and generate strong returns. And we see that we actually see a very um, a very intelligent set of issues come back to us when you ask people what what does a just company look like. Um, it's it's a well rounded you might say almost a throwback to how any entrepreneur or any successful business builder would want to build a business. You look after your stakeholders. And that in turn drives value for your investors and creates a long term successful franchise. So when we first had had the the notion of just and we were out polling, you know, a lot of people in my network would say, well, why are you asking the American people about this? They don't know anything. They don't understand the issues. Seriously, that was a they weren't they're not really sophisticated enough to understand really what's going on. And, um, you know, we found obviously that's not to be the case, but also also sort of an interesting insight into um, the voice of the public. And I would say over the last eight years, particularly over the last four or five years, we've seen the voice of the public and activism among stakeholders skyrocket. And I would say since COVID in particular, the world has come our way, you know, seeing business as a, an absolutely essential driver of strong societal outcomes. As government, if you look at polling data around trust, trust in institutions from Gallup, from Edelman, from others, it's really plummeted. And the, the organization people trust most of it these days is their employer. And the person they trust in terms of, um, information is their CEO. So it's kind of interesting how that's kind of shifted. Government way down. So, so I think we're at a moment in time where societal expectations of business have changed. That if you're a worker, if you're if you're you know one of my kids in, in your early 20s or late teens and you're you're looking to join the a company, you're interested in their values. You want to know what's their stance on pay equity. You know, how, how are they performing on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion? These are the things, what are they doing on climate? These are the things you care about. And so I think in the war for talent, if you think about the importance of engage, employee engagement and the connections to productivity of companies and ultimately their success, uh, you know, 
the relationship between employer and employee is now one of those defining criteria. And I, I sort of feel like that's what just is measuring very, very well. So, so our model essentially tracks how the largest 1,000 publicly traded companies in America perform on the issues that the American people have told us matter most. That's what we do. We produce a ranking with just 100, which we launch uh, with great fanfare with CNBC, our partners. We also produce a lot of content, as you can imagine, our process is very data-driven. So we have a ton of information on how each of those companies is doing on a whole array of issues relating to workers, communities, customers, environment, and uh, you know, shareholders and how a company's led with, with integrity. Um, but we also know that just providing data to the market is not enough to drive change. So over the last few years, we've created a whole set of programs. So we now work with companies and other stakeholders, foundations, um, uh, academia, to drive change in specific areas where we'll bring companies together. There'll be uh, a sort of a data-driven process on how, how can I change? And more and more companies now are knocking on our door to say, we'd like to be more just, or we'd like to be better on this one issue. How do we do that? What does best practice look like? Mm -hmm. How are we benchmarked at the moment? Where are you getting your data? So our relationship with companies has become I think much deeper. We are directly engaged with about uh, just over 500 of the companies that we track. We have created a, a portal where companies log in, see all the data, interact with our analyst team, um, give us data, challenge data, and really just understand the process. And that's built trust. That transparency has, has built our credibility, I think. Um, and so our relationships with companies are deepening, and I think that will be uh, very important to our future as we as we sort of are seen as a as an objective um, independent source of value for companies who want to be better in the stakeholder uh, economy. Um, we're very media focused, so we know the narrative on a lot of issues, which we we discussed earlier. The story about issues in a very divisive time, politically very divisive. Um, we, we, we always try to bring things back to the public, which are who are not as divided as you might think. You know, we've seen agreement across political lines on what a just company looks like. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say it's quite remarkable how much the public agrees when you ask them, what is the role of the company today? Um, so getting that message out into the right, in the right ways with the right messengers is really, really important to us. It's why we, we um, were so, Please, I'm proud of the partnership with CNBC. You'll see us in a lot of media. You know, we are there really to try and create a race at the top. We want to celebrate leadership. We're not about naming and shaming. We're all about trying to lift up leaders. What does leadership look like? Who are those human stories in companies? And ultimately, what is the impact of company leadership on the issues that we're tracking? How are companies successfully creating good jobs? in communities that need them? How are they changing internally so that they're you know, embracing a, a more engaged uh, workforce? And ultimately, we also tell a very strong business story, an investor story. So we have, a, we have an index that we created with Goldman Sachs. We, we licensed at Goldman Sachs, I should say. Um, the Just ETF trades on the New York Stock Exchange. We have today, um, roughly 12 or 13 separate investment products using our data, including the Just ETF, um, and maybe total assets under management um, or under influence uh, uh, north of half a billion dollars right now. So, and the performance of those products has been strongly supportive of this idea that being stakeholder led can translate into greater shareholder returns. So our just index, our flagship index, which picks the best companies in every sector and equal weights them, um, that has outperformed the Russell 1000 benchmark consistently year on year. And now it's up, I, I think it's 60 to 70 basis points over the course of the last um, uh, six years of live, live trading. 
So we think the investment case for justness, for stakeholder leadership is very strong. Um, you know, and uh, I, I think if, if I were to sort of make a plea for where we might think about where all this goes, it would be to invest in more embedded data. We're very focused on the quality of the underlying data. If you follow the ESG um, sort of rise and fall, if you will, of, of ESG, uh, or at least the rise and now the, the skepticism and the questioning of ESG, a lot of it's to do with data and a misunderstanding of sort of what it even means. You know, the, the, the whole space is sort of replete with acronyms and, and confusing language. And I think oftentimes we're disagreeing about something that we're not even, we haven't even, we're not even talking about the same thing. So I, I, you know, I think intelligent discussion and debate around what it, what really is driving, you know, stronger returns, how, what, why should climate matter to a company shareholders? Those aren't political issues to me. Those are scientific issues that translate and result in economic uh, consequences, which any business leader has to understand. Um, analogous to that, I think, is human capital. You know, if you look at the top companies today, they're very strong on understanding how value can be driven by investment in human capital. And, you know, I think we are tapping into that through our survey and polling, through our analysis and through our, um, our program work. How can companies really be just employers? Uh, one of our, the best example of one of our strongest corporate relationships is with PayPal. And if you're looking for an individual leader who sort of, I think, embraces this and is very courageous about telling a story of how, how his company has transformed is Dan Schulman at PayPal. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting sort of journey of surveying employees, expecting a great, very strong feedback and everyone was doing great. They're a very profitable, very successful company, realizing that actually there was a, a quite a you know, significant number of employees who were experiencing great financial hardship. And he felt that was just bad for business and implemented a program now that is really um, driving employee financial wellness. And if any of you that have been in a situation of economic hardship, you know, it's it's hard to be your best self at work. So, so I, I think there's a very strong business case and we are now trying to take that framework and apply that so that it can be implemented by any company. So that's just capital. We're we're a small but mighty organization. Uh, maybe forty five people now full time. We have a phenomenal board, uh, which is itself about thirty strong. Um, some incredible people on our board, uh, and uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm just humbled to lead the organization. We have a very strong advisory network of of former CEOs of big companies. That's 20, 25 strong now. We've got relationships throughout the academic world, media, and and, uh, and um, sort of the donor environment as well, foundations and family offices who just believe in business as a force for good and who've come to the conclusion that just is a very important part of that future. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk about just do a couple of data that, yeah. points, just in three data points. Number one, um, you touched on the research budget. And I just want people to know that this year it'll be a little, more, little I think more than 13 million, of which about 80 percent goes to program. At least 80 percent goes to program, uh, which is it gives you an order of magnitude of how much data we crunch at Just Capital. I think it's a little north of it now. I think. I think. 85% 85 85 goes straight into the into the actual mission the program. So, uh, so it's a tremendous amount of data crunch. And we can talk a little more about that if our questions. Number two, I just, uh, he's referenced the, the nature of what we call stakeholder capitalism in passing. And I think that's, to put a, an umbrella around it, that's something that we've been promoting now for quite some time, many years. And the idea is that if you take care of your stakeholders, the stakeholder that we used to concern ourselves most about, i.e. the shareholders actually get better results. Uh, the third thing that I think is uh, relevant is, uh, Mark, how many uh, interviews of the public have we done to date? And how many do you think we'll do in the next, say, 12 months? I mean, we talked to 
approaching, you know, 150,000 on a fully representative basis. I mean, that's the key is we, we are going to off the beaten path places. We are making sure that the voice of the public as we describe it really is that. And, and so, you know, this has been, this will be our eighth year now of, of survey work. And our partner there is, is Harris. Before that was the National Opinion Research Center. So I say we've got some of the best polling and public opinion research on, on companies yeah. anywhere. And I love how we've gone past Manhattan to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You know, we, you name we it. cover yeah. everywhere in the yeah. country. And I think that's a key component because when you reflect, as you have, that the, 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 with the value system of the public, which is increasingly responding, to what Just Capital is providing the way of data for companies that are valued. Um, that is not just something that's like for the elites of Wall Street. That's actually coming out of Main Street as well as yeah. California and New York. So I just wanted to stress that because I think people sometimes think, well, we talk this way amongst ourselves. We're only talking about a financial elite, but is not the case at all. Look, business has to serve society and it has to reflect the values of the society that it serves. If you look back through history, I mean, I think what's the context which you're which you're quite rightly identifying is what is the role of capitalism today? What is the role of business? Do, do, do people have faith in capitalism in America? Is is it sort of is it okay to question what that even means? Um, you know, I find the quality of debate around that to be very poor right now. It's so divided. It feels like. Anything that is that is that is presented as being other than business as usual, right? Shareholder privacy, anything that sort of deviates from that is somehow woke, is somehow um, soft. You know, something we could do when the sun is shining, everyone's making a lot of money, and we're feeling good. It's about there's a morality to it, there's a purity to it, and I sort of feel like that's such a core framing. Of, of how business really can lift up and create success for a, for a person, for a community, for a country, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that's the backdrop. And I feel like if we, if we can somehow through this fog, create a vision that can unite people rather than divide them about what a good business looks like. What does a values-led business actually do? And how does that really translate into value creation for all stakeholders? Don't forget the business roundtable embraced a stakeholder approach um, under Jamie Dimon's leadership back in 2018. And I think since then we've seen, um, you know, both a doubling down by some companies on that and also a pushback against that model. Certainly we've seen that politically, a pushback against the stakeholder model as somehow, you know, taking money out of shareholders' pockets. But the data doesn't support that. The, the, you know, the data su supports the fact that companies that are investing in their workforce that are building strong communities where they operate, all those things, they're just better companies. And anyone who's run a company knows that to be true. So this is what I find to be sort of very interesting. So I'm really happy to hear that you, you go to the demographics, you get to the, the grassroots opinions. Uh, and now I'm just thinking like a lawyer, but when you're persuading uh, a CEO or a boards of directors or anything else, you can refer to that, of course, but then go to the top of the pyramid as well, and I'm sure you know what I'm about to talk about with your background. But Adam Smith himself, in 1759, published long before his 1776 Book of Nations, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in that book, Adam Smith said exactly what you're saying right now, which is none of it means anything unless there's a mutual uh, collective self-enlightenment uh, in, in the process. Mm -hmm. Because educating and persuasion look good. I'm not sure if the mic picked it up down here, so I'm just going to restate what the comment was with Cameron. So what Ken was referring to is, uh, and it's absolutely accurate, part of our, the foundation documents of Just Capital, 
um, because uh, basically Adam Smith saw himself as a moral philosopher. That was his yeah. self-description. And that was prior to economics even be called a discipline. And what Kim is referring to is the, is the, the sentiments of moral philosophy, which preceded uh, the book, The Wealth of Nations, actually talked about the balance that has to be maintained between business and society. And he was just echoing that that, 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 that strain has been here since before The Wealth of Nations, with Adam Smithsburg, and, and actually does validate a lot of what just capital is about. Um, you know, with the time we've got left, Mark, what do you think, and if there's any other questions, we're gonna take a come. Yeah, Mike. Yes, I have one. Uh, it's, it appears to me you're doing a lot to measure the impact on businesses of following these principles. And I'm wondering how you measure the success of just capital. In other words, your mission is to get business to think differently. You have a way to measure your success. Great comments. I'm going to repeat that for Mike. So Mike was asking, um, if we rank as people know, the thousand largest public companies in America every year, of which we, the top 100 gets published in the dust 100. Uh, and and uh, Mike was complimenting us for the fact that we've been ranking these companies in this very sophisticated way. And he was asking, how do we rank for ourselves how we are succeeding? How, how, what are some of the measures of that? So we measure our success uh, in multiple ways, but really it comes down to are companies becoming more just? So how are they actually changing on the issues that the American people have told us matter? So we we are built to measure that. So we we will be, I will, you know, I can tell you that over 200 companies over the last three years have lifted wages. We've seen uh I think a, a tripling of companies that have conducted pay equity analyses that had you know, had not uh, or, or reported that that had not previously done that so we're tracking individual changes that companies are making across all the things we measure we're also tracking um sort of kpis around the justness of the economy so are we seeing living wage or the stakeholder model be taking root? Are we seeing outcomes that are that are being produced by these changes that companies are making? You know, are we seeing um, labor share of of profits, for example, go up? You would expect that to happen. Are you seeing corporate philanthropy uh, go up as a percentage of earnings? So we're tracking it on various levels. But ultimately, our success, our, our theory of change is that to drive change at scale, we have to shift companies onto a more just course. That's, that, that's really what we want to do. So that's about behavioral change. So our success is really, our companies doing that? And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to report that, you know, our, in our impact measurement, we see companies changing, not just individually for sure, but, you know, in terms of, you know, at scale of dozens of companies now doing things differently than, than they used to. And I, I think, you know, that provides for a very strong return on philanthropy. That's sort of how I talk about it. You know, if you were to put a dollar down into a nonprofit and expect a, a return on that in terms of its impact, just provides a great multiplier effect because we're influence, influencing the behavior of hundreds of companies who employ tens of millions of people. So if you can shift that just a few degrees, you have a, a you know, tremendous uh, philanthropic and, impact. And there's another, we have this pedestrian metrics board looks at, for example, mm -hmm. you might want to mention the statistic of how many companies showed up this year when you opened up the, uh, is, can tell that story. The corporate portal. Yeah. yeah, so- every, There's a corporate portal he's referring to. But. Every year we track our engagement with companies and year on year, it's been really just increasing. We we last year we had something like I don't know four hundred odd companies um, provide thousands and thousands of comments. So that's sort of like a proxy for how seriously companies see us. Because right. don't forget, companies are bombarded with information requests, and and so the fact they're engaging with us, I think. Um, and I say this with a lot of humility, sort of 
tells me that we're on the right track. We have their attention. And so it's up to us to try and use that. This We literally just opened up the corporate portal and we had a webinar where we had over 500 companies registered. Which is, is surprising. I mean, I mean, pleasant surprise. We we knew we would do well, but to have 500 companies show up voluntarily for a webinar as a prelude to open this corporate portal, which will be the direct access point to and from companies, is a very pedestrian but extremely accurate statistic, I think, of corporate engagement. And there are other corporate engagement statistics we keep. I mean, Martin's keeps kicking across the top, but mm -hmm. we look as carefully at how corporate engagement is working for us as we do um, and how companies are servicing stakeholder capitals. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we take the corporate relationships incredibly seriously. It, uh, their feedback is, um, is, is sort of instrumental to our strategy. So we really listen hard to what, to what companies are telling us, what they like and don't like about the process. Um, and then really understanding what makes them tick, you know, which is why our board and our advisory panel is so important. Um, we need to know how companies can change, what issues are they struggling with, what barriers do they see, and how can we help them overcome them and, and tell their story of leadership. I had a question about, Please. you mentioned the, the impoverished debate around what is capitalism, what is the purpose of a business, and that now... Uh, it's become kind of a political, I mean, it has become a political thing where you have woke capitalism, woke mm -hmm. ideas. And that seems to me a sort of a, a pushback almost against the success of the the rev revising of what the purpose mm -hmm. of a corporation is with the stakeholder model as opposed to the shareholder currency. How are you engaging on a political, I mean, do you have a political division? Are you engaging specifically politically? Because you know, I'm just curious yeah. how you're navigating that as a apolitical business organization where, yes, the public is generally in support, but you know how powerful narratives can be. And if it gets hammered enough, it might. Sure. Be I won't repeat that because I think you're close enough to the mic and yeah. you up. But uh, great question. Um, one that is, gets a considerable amount of attention. Let me just say it's occupied a lot of board conversations. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. But we love labels these days, don't we? You know, That's and people terrible. are so quick to jump onto a narrative. Yeah. Um, it's almost like we as a society, like we want division. It feels like that. Uh, we want sim sim simple we want answers. Simplicity. We yeah. like boxes, things to fit in. So we 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 are non-political, first and foremost. We don't have any political leanings mm -hmm. at all. And in fact, we've struggled to, in a, in a world where everything is politicized, you know, we are very keenly aware of trying to not play to any kind of political narrative. Um, we fall back on the polling. So we know when we talk to the public what that division looks like in terms of political uh, affiliation or ideology, but also by race, by gender, by age, by education level, you know, location in the country, et cetera. Um, so that's always our shield. Um, we we have really tried to bring to, to stay true to what we hear through the polling and the survey work, and we try to put the American people's voice um, foremost. So when people say um, a just company pays a living wage, that then for us means okay, well, how do you measure that? Right now, you, it's very difficult to get any data on that. So we're in favor of transparency so that people can understand what companies are paying living wage. Um, living wage could be a political issue, I'm sure it is, but actually when, we, when you poll, you see that a lot of those on the right also believe companies have a duty to be paying a living wage to, to, to their employees. So, we, we, um, so, so that's one area. We try to be very objective, focus on the data quality, focus on the underlying issue, and just tell that story as it is. We try to avoid language that's inflammatory or political. Um, we don't always succeed, but that's what we try to do because any it, that that's a completely changing landscape exactly. as well. Like yeah. climate change, actually, one of the biggest supporters of action on that um, was John McCain, and early on, and and actually, it was George Bush one who who in the Rio Earth Summit 
uh, really elevated, you know, this country's role in sort of Nixon global. founded the EPA. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so it's not like the, the, the right has a history of undermining environmental leadership. On the contrary, so so um, the other thing we are doing a lot is is we will talk to anyone who listens to us in DC. So if there's or anywhere around the country. So if there are state or local officials, if there are senators, congressmen and women who want to talk to us, who care about justness and companies and the voice of the public in their jurisdiction, we'll talk to them. You know, and I I, I hope I hope that 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 those on the left and on the right see value in what we do and somehow can can sort of overcome this sort of gravitational pull towards division. Yeah, we, we like being, we're in the, in, in, the, in the articulation of the choice people get, whether they would prefer Gordon Gecko Green is good, which is shareholder promise, or do they want to see that doing good does, you do well, you do good, and, and, and you do better for your shareholders and for all the other stakeholders, not stakeholder capitalists. And those two are really juxtaposed. They don't have a political ideology. In fact, when I started the Academy in 1986, there were probably three quarters of Republicans, one quarter of Democrats. So it's it's not something that's party driven or I think even ideologically on the spectrum of left to right or anything like that, or woke to to whatever the opposite of woke is, because I don't even know what that word means. Anti-woke. 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 <laughs> Anti-woke. Sleep? No. <laughs> so I think so that's the contrast we want to focus on. Not not the, the baseball, who's up, who's down. And so we 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 do talk to everybody. And Martin's an extremely effective articulator. The business community is listening. Society is listening when they tune in. And and I think that's what we want to be. We want to be just talking about the issues that are most important to the American public so that they can see companies acting in what they perceive to be just behavior. It, it really puzzles me. Like, who would not want companies in the in the area to be good employers? To create great jobs, yeah. to build healthy and strong communities. So, since when has that become something that somehow is, is is weaponized? Like that that is that is so un-American. I I, I, I so anyway. So this is this is why our faith in the voice of the public, I think, is really so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we have time for just one more question or comment. If anybody's got one, yeah, yeah Connor, please. Um, I had a quick question. So you, you're you talking a lot about, you know, um, data sampling, right? How do you know what people want? How do you know what people are looking for? What sort of sampling methods are you using to ensure that there's no bias or any sort of, you know, involuntary leaning that a like, question might push one way or the other? How, what steps are you taking to minimize that? Let me repeat the question. So the question is, what do we do to avoid implicit bias or explicit bias in the dating and the polling that we do? Uh, and I, I'll start by premising that there's always bias, detected or not. But you can go to great lengths to reduce bias, and I think that's what Just Capital does. But let, let you answer that, Martin. Well, the first thing is we have a public opinion research team who has who who is incredible, expert, built their careers are in in. Uh, in social sciences and quantitative opinion research. We then also partner with uh, Harris Analytics and Harris, Harris, what they do for a living is polling across the spectrum. So we we've we feel like we take the whole thing incredibly seriously and we set out to ensure that there's no bias or we've minimized bias to, you know, as much as possible. We're also um, in each of our focus groups, we have designed them so that we, we're ensuring that um, different perspectives are all taken into account. So when we start our focus groups at the beginning of the year, I forget where the first one was, but it was eight people in a room, a bit like this, and with a moderator that starts with a blank sheet of paper that says, okay, what does a just company mean? So there's no like, there's no finger on the scale of what what you know what we think matters, everything starts afresh, and we sort of build from there, and then we're introducing you know the framing, the, the stakeholder framing, um, and you know we just you know you you there are 
strong techniques you can use to ensure that the you know, those whose voices are being represented on the panel, uh, in the focus groups and in the quantitative polling, cover on a on a um, representative basis by census what America looks like today. So that's really the goal is to make sure that we know that when we look at who we've sampled and their declaration of their, um, you know, who they are and where they're from, that matches America by census. And so that, that, that gives us a very strong sense that we've got, you know, representative basis. I have one more question, if okay. that, if we could, you know, which is uh, you're a Brit originally, you're from England, mm -hmm. and this is such a American focused company or organization. What is your relationship to the rest of the world? Because we don't really live in nation states exactly anymore. Our economy is very global. Like how does just capital interact with the global yeah. uh, scene in terms of business? Well, well I, I think our mission and our 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 whole idea ideology of business as a, that's a global mission. Yeah. Naturally, a lot of the issues that are raised are global issues. Uh, we happen to be sampling Amer the, you know, the American public, but you know, I think a lot of those issues transcend you know, countries. Um, I think it's our ambition to grow internationally. We would love to poll in the UK or in China or in you know, other parts of the world. Uh, if we can get the budget to do that. Yeah. So we have to sell yeah. better money. Yeah. We'd love to do that. And then also we would love to expand by by analyzing companies who are that are non-US, you know, large global brands. We don't we don't rank or 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 analyze Honda or you know Unilever or like yeah. major global brands. So we'd love to do that. And it's simply a resource question. It's not it's not a lack of desire. And, and we do indirectly impact those. I mean, when you've got the Walmarts, the Targets, and the Amazons of this world getting ranked, then you do have an, you have an implied uh, ripple effect that does go global, I think. And that's been very positive, very positive. But let me just lend here because I, Mark was kind enough to take a day off from his uh, college tour with Bobby. Thank you, Bobby, for letting your dad <laughs> come you, here today. Uh, and um, I am uh, just want to remind people that the newsletter that Just Capital puts out is a fabulous newsletter. It's easy to read. It comes up once a month um, and gives you a quick update on what's going on. Uh, you can always find it us on CNBC. Uh, and Martin is increasingly quoted by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, other major um, uh, reporters of business theory and of practical business implications for what we can do at this time in the U.S. particularly. And, and please just go to justcapital.com. Yeah. Everything is there and the pop-up, the sign-up, the yeah. newsletter, everything we do, we're very good at publishing everything. So you'll see all the methodology, the data we have, all the program work, uh, it's all at justcapital.com. And you can, if you want to tell your friends about this tape, it'll be on the World Business Academy website, worldbusiness.org. And thank you again for coming, Martin. I really appreciate you dropping by Santa Barbara. And My pleasure. Enjoy the rest thank of the Thank you trip. for being such a wonderful host. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.